Hi guys. So we are covering chapter three today, which is about cells. And cells are really important because they are the basic structural and functional unit of life. So in a nutshell, life begins at cells. We have the hierarchy of organization, which of course starts with atoms, and then atoms combine to form molecules, and molecules combine to form cells. But molecules and atoms are not living things, they are chemical structures. So the cell is what we really start caring about, especially in biology classes. So cells are actually measured in micrometers and they go from extremely tiny to you can see them with the naked eye. They have to be developed and differentiate because each cell is going to have its own unique function. So they're going to develop these specialized characteristics and become what we would call a mature cell or differentiated. As I said, they vary in size and shape. And as we learned in chapter one, structure and function go hand in hand. So structure and function are always going to be interrelated in everything we talk about. So here are a couple examples of some cells. So we have a nerve cell and nerve cells have very long extensions called axons. And we're going to talk about those when we get to the nervous system but they have to have these long extensions because their function is to conduct electrical impulses from one part of the body to another. So those long extensions, those axons, allow the neurons to actually transmit those impulses. On the other hand, epithelial cells are arranged in kind of a flat sheet. So that's going to help them protect anything beneath it. And then we have muscle cells and picture C, which show contractile proteins. Contractile proteins are going to allow the muscles to contract and they're attached to the bones. So they kind of use the bones as a lever system to contract and produce movement. So as you can see with all of these different cells, they are highly varied and each has a specific function, but their structure directly relates to their function. So there isn't really a typical cell. We have so many different types of cells that there isn't any particular thing that they all have, except there are three major parts that all cells have in common, unless you're talking about a prokaryotic cell, but that goes back to biology. Anyway, the three major parts of eukaryotic cells, which are what we care about right now, are the nucleus, which is the control center. It's, think of it as the boss. And then you have the cytoplasm, which kind of suspends all of the organelles. And then we have the cell membrane, which surrounds the cell. So the cytoplasm itself actually has a partial liquid component called cytosol. And then the organelles are kind of suspended in it. So the cytoplasm is made up of the organelles and the cytosol. So don't get those two terms confused. This is a composite of a cell, basically having all of the possible components that the cell could have. Keep in mind, structure and function go hand in hand. So not all cells are going to have all of these particular components and not all cells will have them in the ratio that we see here. For example, smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps detoxify our bodies. So the liver is going to have a lot of cells with a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum as opposed to, let's say, uh, skin cell. Skin cells do not necessarily need as much smooth endoplasmic reticulum because of their function. They are protective in nature. So liver cells, which function in detox, need more. So that kind of shows you how structure and function go hand in hand. So the cell or plasma membrane is the outer boundary of the cell. So it surrounds the cell and it maintains the integrity of the cell. So it's going to help the cell maintain its shape. Very importantly, it regulates what comes in and out of the cell. It is selectively permeable, which means it only lets some substances in and some substances out. And don't forget what I told you in the last few lectures, pay attention to things in red and blue because they're important. 
So signal transduction is what actually permits the cell to get and receive and then respond to messages. And the plasma membrane consists mainly of lipids and proteins. And then there's some carbohydrates interspersed in there. So the framework is a phospholipid bilayer. So this is where the lipids come into play. Hopefully you remember from biology that the phospholipid bilayer has two parts. It has water soluble or hydrophilic heads, which are on the surfaces. And then it has hydrophobic, which are water insoluble tails. And those are kind of tucked in the interior. So think of it like a sandwich. The bread are those phospholipid heads. And then the meat of your sandwich are those tails. So the tails are tucked in, in the middle of the bread, safe from any water that would potentially touch it. And then the heads are the bread, and those are going to protect the tails. Again, the bilayer is permeable to lipid-soluble substances and impermeable to water-soluble substances. So as I said, it lets certain things in and certain things out. So that selective permeability helps protect the cell. Cholesterol is also a part of the plasma membrane. It helps to stabilize the membrane and helps keep it impermeable to those water-soluble substances. So basically what cholesterol does is it's kind of tucked between the phospholipids and it'll kind of hang on to them. And if the environment gets really hot, when things get hot, they tend to melt. So normally the bilayer would kind of start to spread apart. But this cholesterol kind of hangs on to those phospholipids to help stabilize it and keep it from completely falling apart. On the other hand, when it gets cold, things tend to solidify and freeze up, right? So the cholesterol, again, between those phospholipids is going to kind of push the phospholipids away from each other to help maintain that fluidity. Now, some lipids and proteins can move within the bilayer. So it's actually called the fluid, fluid mosaic model. It's fluid because it can move and mosaic because it has proteins kind of interspersed between the lipids and the cholesterol as well. Those membrane proteins that are kind of interspersed all over the place do have a lot of functions. Some of them function as pores, others function as channels so things can pass through. Some function as receptors so things like hormones can bind to it. Some function as enzymes to catalyze reactions and others function in cell contact and identification. So basically what that means is it helps the immune system identify cell cells. So all of our cells have certain markers on them which say, hey, I'm a cell cell, don't attack me. And that way the immune system can kind of recognize, well, this is one of us and that's not. So then it knows what to attack. And then cell adhesion molecules, which basically do exactly as it says, they help things adhere. And then carbohydrates kind of hang off some of those membrane proteins, and those are really what function in the cell recognition and interaction. So they're self-markers. So like I said, the immune system can recognize that that's a cell that it doesn't want to attack because that's a self-cell versus foreign cells that'll have different markers. So this is just a picture showing you the cell membrane and the close-up. So you can see the lipid bilayer. So as I said, the heads, the phospholipid heads are kind of like the bread. And then the meat in the middle are those tails. So the tails are protected like the meat and the bread protection. And that way you can have things only come in and certain things only go out. This is showing you the proteins that are kind of interspersed all through the plasma membrane. Those are the purple things. And then if you look real closely, you can see those tiny yellow cholesterol molecules that are kind of hanging on to those phospholipids to help maintain that fluidity. And then the green things coming off of the proteins are glycoproteins and glycolipids. Glyco just means sugar, carbohydrate. So it's just a carbohydrate chain attached to a protein for a glycoprotein or a carbohydrate chain attached to a lipid is a glycolipid. So the glycolipids are coming directly off the plasma membrane, the phospholipids, 
and the glycoproteins are coming off those proteins that are interspersed. And again, they function in cell recognition, so they're very important. You can also have what are called transmembrane proteins or peripheral proteins. Transmembrane proteins span the whole layer of the phospholipid bilayer. So they go from the top of the phospholipid bilayer all the way to the bottom. Peripheral proteins, on the other hand, just kind of hang out on the surface on one side or the other. Some of these things can cause problems, though, of course, as we know. So mutations in sodium channels can actually cause an inability to feel pain or extreme pain. So the sodium channels are proteins that basically have a hole going through them. So sodium can pass through in the right conditions. We also have potassium channels, which are kind of the same thing. So mutations in potassium channels can actually disrupt the electrical activity of the heart and it can disturb our heart rhythm and it might even impair our hearing. We will talk more about sodium and potassium channels later on in the semester and we will talk about the heart activity in AMP2. We also have abnormal chloride channels, which actually cause cystic fibrosis. If you have cystic fibrosis, you have respiratory infections a lot. Basically what happens is mucus is overproduced and it's really thick. So it causes difficulty breathing and you have a really salty sweat and it can often clog your pancreas. And as I said, you have a lot of respiratory infections. Some people with cystic fibrosis need to pound on their chest really hard to clear it out. And they actually have little vests that they can also wear that will kind of pound on their lungs when they need it to. CAMs or cellular adhesion molecules guide the cells on how to move. Selectins will actually coat white blood cells and kind of anchor them by providing friction. And integrins direct the white blood cells through the capillary walls to get to wherever an infection might be happening so that they can, of course, help fix that infection. They also guide embryonic cells towards the maternal cells in order to form that placenta and establish connections between nerve cells. So cellular adhesion molecules do a lot of things. Um, they direct, they guide, they help connect, help attach, and that's all very important, especially the ones for early embryonic development. The cytoplasm is organelles and they are suspended in cytosol. So the cytoplasm basically is equal to the cytosol plus the organelles. And organelles are tiny little factories that have specific functions in many animal cells. And there are a lot of different organelles. And again, that's in red, so make sure you remember that. So the cytosol is basically the fluid portion of the cytoplasm, and then the organelles are the tiny structures with specific functions inside the cell. So if you're talking about the cytosol, you're just talking about the fluid portion of the cytoplasm. If you're talking about the cytoplasm, you're talking about both the cytosol and the organelles. And then the cytoplasm also contains what's called the cytoskeleton which is basically a framework of protein rods and tubules that, again, perform some different functions. Ribosomes are composed of RNA, ribosomal RNA to be exact. They can either be free-floating in the cytoplasm or they can be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They provide a structural support and enzyme activity in order to build proteins. So they will link amino acids together to form proteins. The endoplasmic reticulum, you have two types. You have rough ER and smooth ER. They are named because of their appearance. Rough ER actually has ribosomes attached to it. So it has a studded or rough looking appearance and it conducts protein synthesis. Smooth ER does not have any ribosomes attached to it. So it has a smooth looking appearance, but it does conduct lipid synthesis and helps with detox. Then we have vesicles, which are membranous sacs, which either store or transport substances. And the Golgi apparatus is a series of sacs, of flattened sacs, and basically they're like the post office. 
They refine, package, and deliver proteins made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So think about the post office. You take your package to the post office. They make sure that it's in the correct size box. They make sure that it has the right postage, and they make sure it gets where it needs to go. That's what the Golgi apparatus does. It will modify any proteins or lipids that come into it. It will make sure they're correctly packaged, and then it's going to deliver them where they need to go. Milk is an example of organelle interaction and the transport of substances by vesicles because milk fats are actually synthesized in the smooth ER, and then they will be transported in a vesicle to go where it needs to go. So that's kind of an interesting little side note. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. So this is a membrane-bound fluid-filled sac. They have chemical reactions that are going to help get energy from nutrients. Basically, they perform cellular respiration, and that's going to produce ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, and that is the energy currency of the cell. So that is what energizes the cell and helps the cell perform all of the reactions that it has to perform. Now, the interesting thing about mitochondria, just a little side note, is that mitochondria has its own DNA. So mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, the tail falls off and the head goes in. So the tail is what actually has all of the mitochondria. So the father's mitochondria is lost. So you get your mitochondrial DNA directly from your mother. You will have identical mitochondrial DNA. And if nuclear DNA is not available at a crime scene, they can actually use mitochondrial DNA to find a suspect and even prosecute somebody. Lysosomes are small membranous sacs. They have hydrolytic enzymes, which are going to break down anything. So they're the garbage disposals of the cell. So they will break down any foreign material or even other organelles that are worn out. Peroxisomes are very similar to lysosomes, except instead of hydrolytic enzymes, they have oxidative enzymes. So oxidative enzymes are going to digest alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and lipids. So lysosomes have hydrolytic enzymes, so water is basically used to break these bonds and break things down. Peroxisomes have oxidative enzymes, so they neutralize free radicals and break down lipids and alcohols. So again, going back to liver cells, we talked about liver cells having more smooth endoplasmic reticulum because of its detox functions. They're also going to have more peroxisomes because of their detox functions. The cytoskeleton I kind of briefly talked about earlier, but the cytoskeleton has a variety of filaments and a variety of functions. So there are three basic structures that form the cytoskeleton microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments. Microtubules are the largest ones. They help maintain their shape of the cell, and they make up cilia, flagella, and centrioles. But the neat thing about microtubules is they also form a framework to help move organelles around the cell. So a motor protein can actually attach to an organelle, and then it can attach to the microtubule, and kind of scoot along to move an organelle wherever it needs to go inside the cell. Intermediate filaments, as the name kind of implies, are the mid-sized ones. They're composed of several different proteins, but their basic function is support. So they will support the nuclear envelope and support the plasma membrane, and basically support the cell. And the microfilaments are the smallest ones. These are tiny rods made up of a protein called actin but they're very important in muscle contraction. So they provide cellular movement. We will talk a lot more about actin when we get to the chapter on muscles. The centrosome is a central body which consists of two centrioles. In the cytoplasm, it is near the nucleus and centrioles are important because they produce the spindle fibers during cell division. And then those spindle fibers are going to distribute the chromosomes to form the daughter cells. Cilia are mobile extensions of the cell membrane. They consist of microtubules, 
and they kind of form a fringe on the surface of certain epithelial cells. So some epithelia will be ciliated, some will not be. They're shorter than flagella, so they're more hair-like, and they're usually very abundant when present. So flagella are long, whip-like tails, and cilia are short, hair-like projections. They beat in a back-and-forth motion, but it's very coordinated. And what they do is move things across surfaces. So they propel mucus in the respiratory tract, and they will propel the egg toward the uterus. So cilia are more for moving things across surfaces, and flagella are more for movement. So as I said, flagella are longer than cilia, and they cause the entire cell to move. The only human cell that has a flagella is the sperm, and each cell only has one flagellum. There are a few diseases that happen at the organelle level. Well, there are a lot of diseases that happen at the organelle level. One of them is malus, which happens if something is wrong with the DNA in the mitochondria. Basically, what happens is the person cannot get the maximum energy that they need from the nutrients they take in, so they need extra nutrients. Crab disease is caused by an inability to produce a lysosomal enzyme. So basically, they're not going to be able to break certain things down. And they also cannot produce myelin for the nerve cells. And that's going to damage their nervous system. We will actually talk more about that one when we get to the nervous system. ADL, adrenal leukodystrophy, is caused by a lack of protein in peroxisomes. So what happens is fatty acids start to build up, and that's going to destroy the myelin sheaths of the nerve cells, so nerves won't be able to transmit those impulses very quickly, and movement is going to be impacted. And again, this is another one we'll talk about when we get to the nervous system. The nucleus, the control center, think of the nucleus as your boss. So the nuclear envelope is a double membrane that surrounds the nucleus that actually has nuclear pores so that things can get out. It separates the nucleoplasm from the cytoplasm, and the nucleoplasm is just the cytoplasm inside the nucleus, basically. And as I said, nuclear pores allow certain substances to pass. Chromatin is the cell's chromosomes, and it stores information for protein synthesis, and of course, dictates everything we do. But this is in a stringy kind of structure, so it looks more like spaghetti. When the cell is ready to divide, the chromatin will wrap around those histone proteins and condense and condense and condense until it gets down to chromosomes. And then the nucleolus is a body of RNA and protein, but this is where ribosomes are produced. So in the picture, it shows you the nucleus and then inside the ball, is the nucleolus. And then that stringy stuff is the chromatin coming out. And then you have the nuclear pores. So how do things move in and out of the cell? Well, there's two ways, passive or active. Passive processes do not require ATP. So think about being passive. If you're passive, you're kind of just going with the flow. You're not requiring a lot of energy, you're passive. But if you're active, now you're moving around, you're doing stuff, now you're going to need energy. So passive processes include diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion and filtration, active processes are active transport, and then endocytosis and exocytosis, which are forms of bulk transport, and transcytosis. So diffusion is relatively simple. Atoms or molecules move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until equilibrium is reached. So basically until they're spread out. This happens because the atoms, molecules, and ions are constantly bumping into each other. So they'll bump into each other and move until they're all spread out. Only substances that the cell membrane is permeable to can diffuse. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, and some other lipid-soluble substances. The biggest ones are oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen will diffuse into the cells, and carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the cells. It's a passive process, so no ATP is required. 
Imagine if you put a sugar cube or some dye into a beaker of water. Eventually, the sugar cube is going to dissolve to where it's sugar water, and all of the particles of sugar are evenly spread out. Or the dye is going to eventually dissolve and spread out to where it's an even color now. Okay, so this is just a picture showing you diffusion. So you have your solute molecules versus your water molecules. And if the membrane is permeable to both the solute and the water molecule, equilibrium is going to be reached when the concentrations of both sides are equal. Facilitated diffusion is a little different. Facilitated diffusion happens across the membrane through ion channels or transporters. So this goes back to those proteins that are in the membrane. Some of the proteins have a channel going through them so that ions can just pass directly through the channel. Others will attach to the substance and they're called carrier proteins and then transport the substance in. So sodium, potassium, chloride, glucose, amino acids are all things that will have facilitated diffusion. Still a passive process though, no ATP is required we're still moving from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis is the movement of water. So anytime you hear osmosis, think water. The water moves across the selectively permeable membrane from a region of higher concentration to lower concentration. So an area of higher water concentration to an area of lower water concentration. So it's still a passive process. No ATP is required because the water is moving from where there's a lot of water to where there's not as much water. So it's still moving down its concentration gradient. Keep in mind when this happens, the volume is going to change because the water is moving. So like the picture shows you, in the first picture, sides A and B have the same amount of water. But then after the water moves, now the side A has a lot more water than side B. The water is basically moving to try to equal out the concentrations. So osmotic pressure is the ability of osmosis to generate pressure to actually lift a volume of water. So as the osmotic pressure increases, the concentration of impermeable solutes is going to increase. Okay, these pictures show you three animal cells, red blood cells to be specific, in three different solutions. So isotonic solutions have the same concentration of solutes inside the cell as they do outside the cell. So there's not going to be any movement of water. The cell is going to stay the same shape and happy. In a hypertonic solution, there's a higher concentration of solutes outside the cell than there is inside the cell. So the water is actually going to leave the cell and go outside the cell Think of it as the water's trying to dilute down the environment so that the concentrations are equal. But this causes the cell to shrink. It's called crenation because water leaves the cell. In a hypotonic solution, there is more solute inside the cell than outside the cell. So water is going to go into the cell to think about it as it's trying to dilute down the cell's concentration but this causes the cell to swell. So the way I remembered it was hypertonic. If somebody's hyper, they're running all over the place. And that's kind of what that red blood cell looks like. Water's running out of the cell. In a hypotonic solution, the O, the cell swells and forms a big O, and the water's going into the cell. Filtration forces molecules through the membrane by basically inserting pressure. This is used to separate solids from water or to differentiate between small particles and large ones. For example, when blood plasma leaves the capillaries, the water and small solids are going to be filtered, but the large plasma proteins are not. It's a passive process. No ATP is required. And we'll actually talk more about this in AMP2 when we get to the kidneys. Active transport, on the other hand, requires ATP. So we've been going from a region of high concentration to low concentration, said to be going down its concentration gradient. Now with active transport, we're going against the concentration gradient. So we're going from low concentration to high concentration. 
It's used as carrier molecules inside the cell membrane. Again, it's an active process, so it requires ATP. So sugars, some amino acids, calcium, protons, sodium, potassium, these are all examples. The sodium potassium pump we will talk a lot about when we get to the chapter on muscle tissue. Endocytosis is bulk transport. This is when you move substances into the cell inside a vesicle. So basically the substances are too large to get in any other way. There are three types of endocytosis. Pinocytosis, the membrane engulfs little droplets of liquid. So it's also referred to as cell drinking. So basically what happens is the plasma membrane just kind of folds in a little bit and closes the droplets and brings them in. Phagocytosis is when the membrane engulfs solid particles. This is also referred to as cell eating. So now the membrane has to actually reach out and grab the particle with pseudopodia and then bring it in. And then receptor-mediated endocytosis is when the membrane engulfs specific substances that have actually bound to receptor proteins on the membrane. So the hormone or whatever it is will bind to the receptor and then it will engulf it and bring it in. So this is showing you phagocytosis and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So big thing here is notice that the particles bind to those receptors and then the cell membrane will indent and fold around it to bring it in. Exocytosis is the opposite. Think of exo exit. You release substances or particles from the cell. Vesicles will contain particles and fuse to the cell membrane and then release the contents. An example are the release of neurotransmitters from nerve cells. And again, we will talk a lot about that when we get to the chapter on the nervous system or chapters on the nervous system. Transcytosis involves receptor-mediated endocytosis followed by exocytosis. So it's actually two processes in one. This gives our cells the ability to transport substances really quick from one end of the cell to the other. It's going to move substances across barriers formed by tight connected cells. Example is the transport of HIV across the lining of the anus or the vagina, unfortunately. So those HIV infected cells are brought all the way across from one end to the other relatively quickly. The cell cycle is a series of changes that the cells go through when it's time to divide. It's divided into interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. And then interphase is divided into three phases, as you can see, and mitosis is divided into four. Interphase is the time that the cell spends the most time in. This is when it's growing and maintaining normal functions. It replicates the DNA and synthesizes organelles, membranes, and other chemicals that it needs to divide. The synthesis phase, or the S phase, is when DNA is replicated. Adenine binds with thymine, and cytosine binds with guanine. Complementary base pairing is what this is known as. Notice that's in red. The G1 and G2 phases are also referred to as the growth phase or gap phases. This is basically when other structures replicate and the cells grow during this time. Mitotic cell division is going to produce two daughter cells from one somatic cell. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus, so that's when the chromosomes will actually divide. Cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. So there's four phases of mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, otherwise known as PMAT. Prophase is when the chromatin condenses and winds around those histone proteins to form chromosomes. So chromatin is that spaghetti stuff, so it condenses down to chromosomes. The centrioles are going to move into place, and then the nuclear envelope and nucleolus will disappear. In metaphase, the spindle fibers form centrioles and attach to the chromosomes and line them up in the middle. So remember, metaphase, middle. And then in anaphase, the chromosomes start to separate and move in opposite directions towards the centrioles. So they look like little Vs coming across. So think of anaphase, they look like little Vs. And then telophase, the chromosomes return to chromatin 
everything comes back. Telophase is basically the reverse of prophase. So the nuclear envelope reforms, the nucleoli become visible, um, the chromosin, chromosomes go back to chromatin, and the key feature of telophase is you're going to see a cleavage furrow forming in the middle. So the cell is going to get pinched into two by this cleavage furrow. So prophase, think of the chromosomes actually become visible, but they're not in any particular order. In metaphase, middle, they're lined up at the middle. Anaphase, V, they look like little Vs. And then telophase, you're looking for that cleavage furrow pinching the cells in half. It's just a chart showing you the major events that we just covered. And this is showing you mitosis itself. So you've got prophase where the chromosomes become visible. Metaphase, they line up in the middle. Anaphase, they look like little Vs and they're separating out. And then telophase, you're looking for that cleavage for that indentation on the two sides of the cell. And then you end up with two daughter cells. Cytokinesis is when the cytoplasm divides. It starts during anaphase and continues all through telophase. A contractile ring of actin filaments pinches that cytoplasm in half. So that forms that cleavage for what I was talking about. Newly formed cells are going to have identical DNA, but might have a different size and number of organelles. But the important part is that the DNA is identical. So frequency of cell division has to be regulated and is different depending on the type of cell. Skin cells, intestinal cells, and blood-forming cells divide often and continuously. Our skin cells are continuously dividing and shedding, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the skin. Neurons, however, divide a specific number of times and then stop. What happens is the ends of the chromosomes are called telomeres, and every time a cell divides, those tips shorten. So you have what's called a mitotic clock because cells can only divide a certain number of times before those telomeres start to turn into genes that we actually lose because the telomeres protect the tips. But since they shorten every time the cell divides, that's less telomere protection those chromosomes have. At a certain point, you would start to hit genes. And if you start losing genes, it's not going to be conducive to living so we have to stop. Cells divide to provide a more favorable surface area to volume relationship. Cells have to stay small so that their surface area to volume relationship stays in intact. Cells need to be able to transport substances in and out of the cell so their volume can't be tremendous. They won't survive. Hormones and growth factors externally control cell division and contact inhibition stops healthy cells from dividing. Basically what happens is the cells divide and they touch each other. And when they touch each other, they stop dividing because they contact each other. Tumor cells can result if this control over the frequency of mitosis happens. So if we lose control in one way or another and cells keep dividing when they're not supposed to be, that can result in a tumor. So we have two types of tumors, benign and malignant. Benign tumors are non-cancerous and they stay in a local area. Malignant tumors, however, are very invasive and they're cancerous and they can metastasize or spread. Two major types of genes cause cancer, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Oncogenes, you have abnormal forms of genes and they actually control the cell cycle, but they can become overexpressed and lead to cancer. And tumor suppressor genes do exactly what the name implies. They suppress tumor growth because they normally limit mitosis. But if they're inactivated or removed, they can't regulate mitosis. There's one tumor suppressor gene called the P54 tumor suppressor gene. And this is found to actually be mutated in over 50% of the cancers that we have. So that's a big one. And that picture showing you normal cells versus cancer cells. So when cancer is developing, you start out, you have healthy specialized cells. The oncogenes are expressed normally. Tumor suppressor genes are expressed. 
and cell division stays under control. We keep it in check. However, if a single oncogene is turned on or a tumor suppressor gene is turned off, this takes those controls off. And now cell division can start happening frequently. And the cells actually become what we call immortal because there aren't any limits on cell division. So if this happens from exposure to say radiation or a chemical, or it could even happen from an inherited mutation. Like I said, that P54 tumor suppressor gene is mutated in a lot of cancers. Malignancy often results from a series of mutations happening. So an affected cell is going to divide more often than it should, and it starts to lose its specialization. Once that happens, it can be invasive and it can start to get its own blood supply, and then it can invade other tissues, especially if it gets into the blood vessels or lymphatic system. And then as the cells are traveling, they start to mutate. So the more areas that the tumors infect, the harder it's going to be to treat. So differentiation is that process of specialization of cells. Stem cells can actually divide to form new stem cells and they can differentiate into many cell types. Progenitor cells are partially specialized stem cells that can divide to become a number of different cells and this is called a committed cell. If something is called totipotent, the daughter cells can actually become any cell type. So you can turn that cell into anything. So fertilized eggs and cells of the early embryo are examples. Pluripotent stem cells can become a limited number of cell types. Stem cells, their later development and progenitor cells are examples. So what we really want are those totipotent stem cells that can then specialize into any type of cell we want. So here's an example of formation of the blood cells in the red bone marrow. You have the stem cell, in this case, the hematopoietic stem cell or a blood cell, giving us a stem cell to renew itself and then a progenitor cell, which will then specialize into a number of different types of white blood cells. Differentiation here, you have a fertilized egg that can produce any type of human cell, while it's partially differentiated cells can only produce certain types of cells. So you have the difference between producing any type of cells versus producing certain types of cells. So stem cells and progenitor cells are required for growth and healing. We have a field of study called regenerative medicine that actually uses the body's ability to generate new cells in order to treat diseases and injuries. This is including stem cell technology. So we take stem cells and we can turn them into different types of cells. Umbilical cord cells are really good stem cells to use because you can basically turn those cells into any type of cell, meaning we have the potential to start to help people who are paralyzed. Stem cells from the patient can either come from a natural site like bone marrow, or we can reprogram differentiated cells in cell culture. Skin cells is one that we're making quite a bit of progress with, actually. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, and you need to know that. It's a normal part of development, and it's a continuous process. Basically, apoptosis is when the cell commits suicide. It kills itself. It digests itself. But this is how the webbing between our fingers and toes as a fetus are removed. And it's a protective function. So it's why our skin kind of peels away after we get sunburn. Necrosis is not a normal process. This is cell death due to damage. And this is not something you want. This happens if you get like an infection and the tissue isn't getting enough nutrients and oxygen and blood and it will turn black and start to die. So in a nutshell, proteins are gonna be synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Fats will be synthesized in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and sugars in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then everything is gonna be processed in the Golgi. Sugars and proteins will be released from the Golgi and vesicles. 
and then secreted from the cell and taken where they need to go. Fats travel directly from the smooth ER to the cell membrane, and then they're going to be encased in a layer of cell membrane to be exported from the cell. Fats are treated specially because they're different. They're handled differently with digestion. And we'll talk about that in the second semester as well. So that's chapter three. Hopefully some of it was reviewed from biology. And we will talk about chapter four next time. I will talk to you later. Bye.